Hello everybody, welcome to this little talk on introducing demoscopy and taking photos in practice. I'm Chin Waibru, I'm a GP in Cheltenham and I do lots of demoscopy teaching for various people. So first question to ask ourselves is, why are we doing demoscopy in the first place? What's it all about? And I think that's best explained if we think about some ugly ducklings here. All of these were lesions that the patients were worried about. They stood out as individual lesions that could be of concern. Then we've got these lesions, which are some less ugly ducklings. None of these were things that were particularly concerning the patient. And demoscopy helped us to identify what each of these six lesions were. And I'm going to come back to that shortly. So what actually is demoscopy and how does it work? First thing that you have with a dermatoscope is you have 10 times magnification and a nice bright light. So why don't we just use a magnifying glass and some light? which would be an awful lot cheaper than these very expensive bits of kit. And the key is that with demoscopy, we have some magic. And the magic lets us see through the surface of the skin. And there are two ways we can do that. We can do that using polarized light, or we can use that, do that, sorry, using contact fluid. And of course we can use both. So if you imagine, for example, you have a swimming pool, and it's got patterned tiles in it, and you think that one of the tiles might be cracked. You could drain the pool and have a look, and that'd be equivalent to doing a biopsy. Or you could just look through your polarized glasses, and that will let you see through the surface of the water, and you'll be able to see the bottom of the pool. Or you can get out your glass bottom boat and take that across the pool, and so long as there are no air bubbles between the glass bottom and the surface of the pool, you'll be able to see very nicely. And of course, you can wear your polarized glasses while sitting in your glass bottom boat. So let's have a look at that in real life with a lesion. And here is a nice benign mole. And here we are with no liquid interface and non-polarized light. So this is not demoscopy. This is just magnification with light. And we get quite a good picture, you know, it's significantly better than the picture that we had previously. However, as soon as we turn on the polarization on the dermatoscope, we can suddenly see far more structures. So for example, we can see this nice area over on the right hand side here where we can see that actually there's a network there. The next thing that we can do is we can put fluid on. And in this case, on the next slide, you're going to see the same pictures, so non-polarised light on the left and polarised on the right, but with some contact fluid added for both. And you will see, if we just look at the pictures on the left here, this is the contact fluid, non-polarised light on the left, and here it is with no contact fluid. On the right, we've got polarised light, and when we add contact fluid there, we can actually see more structures. Now, in this particular lesion, we can see similar structures with polarized and non-polarized demoscopy. And that's the comparison we're making on this particular slide. Here's another example where, again, we've got um, very little difference between polarized and non-polarized demoscopy. The difference in these pictures, these pictures are dry at the top and wet at the bottom, and they are polarized on the right and non-polarized on the left. So this one here, top left, is not demoscopy at all. This is non-polarized light and no contact fluid, so there is no magic. So that is not demoscopy. And if you take pictures with dry, with non-polarized light, this is not demoscopy that you're doing. As soon as you turn the polarized light on, as we've done top right here, we can see a few more structures, but there's an awful lot of this um, scale in the background. If we put some contact fluid on, we can see with normal light, we get a, a half decent picture, but contact fluid with polarized light gets us much the best picture of the lot. And there it is zoomed in. And there we can see much, much more detail than we could previously. Now, for some lesions, we can actually see different structures with polarised and non-polarised demoscopy. And some of those differences can help make the diagnosis. So, for example, this is polarised and non-polarised light. 
pictures the same. So this is wet polarized and this is wet non-polarized. And what we can see in the non-polarized is we can see these darker areas here. These are the comedo-like openings and these white shiny structures here, which are the milia-like cysts, which help us to diagnose this lesion as a seborrheic keratosis. On the other hand, here is a lesion on a leg where this is the non-polarized demoscopy. And when we turn on the polarized light, we suddenly see these white lines. And these are polarization specific white lines. The other thing that happens is this area in here at the bottom of blue white veil in non-polarized light, when you put polarized light on, we start to see these very, very pretty, um, almost rainbow like patterns of white lines on these as well. Now, bright white lines may sometimes be the only clue that there's something nasty going on. So in this case, we've got some bright white lines showing up here. Um, and actually with the non-polarized demoscopy of this, it was much harder to tell. So where we see white lines, sometimes they can be the only sign, for example, of melanoma. Now, one of the issues that we do have with some dermatoscopes is that some dermatoscopes will not show the bright white lines very well. So this is a comparison of two different scopes, both made by the same company. This is the on the left, the high neat Delta 20, and we've got non-polarized at the bottom and polarized at the top. And we can see there are a lot of polarization specific white structures in this one. Same company, Heine, make the Delta 30. And this is the non-polarized and polarized views of the same lesion as that one on the left hand side, taken on the same day with the same camera by the same photographer. Um, and you will see that here there is much, much less of a difference between the polarized and non-polarized views. And that is something when choosing your dermatoscope and which dermatoscope you're going to use, you do need to be aware that not all dermatoscopes are equal, particularly in how well they show the bright white structures. There's much more information about that on the PCDS website. And I've actually got a comparative picture of this lesion taken with, I think, 15 different dermatoscopes um, on the PCDS website. So let's go back to these lesions that were worrying clinically. And we can see with the demoscopy for the first one, these comedo-like openings and milia-like cysts, which tell us it's a seborrheic keratosis. For the middle one, we can see features of a globular nevus. And for the one on the right, we can see features of an angioma. So all benign lesions that potentially look nasty clinically. Then the less worrying lesions clinically, well, on the left, we've got this one, which has lots of white lines. And these are polarization specific white lines. And this one is a melanoma. This innocuous looking mole on this chap's arm put the dermatoscope on and once again this looks very very irregular this is another melanoma this man thought he had another bleeding seborrheic keratosis he's had several in the past but put the dermatoscope on and this looks very very abnormal and this again is another melanoma so demoscopy is very helpful in distinguishing benign from malignant lesions and there are lots and lots of different dermatoscopes those are the pictures that's the picture of all the dermatoscopes before I took the 15 um, polarized pictures of that same lesion. But let's have some practical tips now. So if you're sharing a scope, it needs to be kept somewhere safe where everyone can find it who needs it. It's really helpful to charge it each time you use it. But for some of the scopes, the battery won't last as long if you leave it permanently charging. And so what we tend to do is to charge it each time we use it before putting it away. Now, dermatoscopes are very expensive pieces of equipment. And if you drop them, they have a nasty habit of breaking. So do try not to drop them. They need cleaning from time to time. The end plate will need cleaning on the outside after every patient, so in between patients. If you have a dermatoscope with a completely enclosed end plate, then you don't need to clean the inside of it. But if it's not completely enclosed, then you may need to. It's not just the scope we have to clean though. Sometimes we have to actually clean the patient as well. 
And when I'm talking about cleaning the patient, what I'm talking about here is removing any loose crust or scale on the surface. So in this case, there was a scab on the surface when he came in, and I've just removed that with a wet paper towel. You can see that it is bleeding a little bit. And so long as you are quick and you apply some contact fluid, you should be able to get a decent picture that will give you plenty of information before you get too much blood obscuring your field of view. Sometimes you'll come across a lesion like this. This is just a heavily pigmented nevus and on arrival it appears to have black blotches within it. What we need to do now is scrape off all of that fluid, get some tape and stick it onto the lesion, peel it off, stick it on and peel it off. And that will just take off those skin flakes, those dead flakes of skin on the surface, which are actually creating the artifactual black blot blotches. Once we've taken off those just free scales of skin, and they're just pigmented scales of skin, then there are no black blotches, they were all artifact, and we're able to see the nice normal mole underneath. So with any dermatoscope, what you need to know is how to switch it on, how to switch between modes, how to extend the end plate unless it's a fixed focus scope, how to focus it unless it's a fixed focus scope, how to apply the contact fluid, how to attach the phone or camera that you're taking pictures with and how to clean it afterwards. Now for contact fluid, let's just have a think about which contact fluid we're going to use. So for flat lesions, an alcohol swab should be absolutely adequate, but that's only going to work if it's completely flat because you've got to make sure that there are no air bubbles between the end plate and the skin surface. For most lesions, we would use alcohol gel, so long as we have the gel type alcohol gel. There's been a recent change where the um, alcohol gel that we have on our desk has changed to a much, uh, much more liquid formulation, and this is not nearly as suitable for doing dermoscopy. In that case, what we need to do is to go and get the lubricating gel, which we would also use in any case for lesions near eyes or on broken skin or nail folds. And the reason for using it near the eyes or on broken skin is because alcohol will sting. And the reason for using it on nail folds is because you need something a little bit more viscous because you've got to fill up that gap so that there's no air bubbles between the skin and the end plate. Occasionally, if you've got something with a really deep crease, maybe deep in the, in the fold between toes, for example, then we may need to use ultrasound gel just because it's that bit more viscous. For hygiene, have a think about whether your scope can take disposable end caps. And if it can't, then cling film is another alternative. And if you're going to use cling film, what you do is you get a roll of cling film and you get a hacksaw and you cut it into a narrower roll of cling film. Because if you're trying to take it from a long roll, then you're going to be wasting a lot each time. Another hygiene consideration is whether you use your lubricating gel in sachets or not. Um, it's more expensive in sachets than it is in tubes, and there are some arguments about whether that's necessary or not. But if um, infection control say that you need to be using sachets, lubricating gel certainly comes in them. Here's an example of cling film. And I've literally taken a, a, a hacksaw to a roll of cling film, and then I can take pieces off to put over the scope for the hygiene purposes. It is much easier though, I have to say, if you have a scope that comes with the disposable end caps. A few more practical tips. You need to record what you see. Um, this is all about taking photos, which is clearly the point, but you need to record the photos in a safe way. And in general, we would recommend always using an app. So either something like Pando, which lets you use your NHS net email or a bespoke app. And there are lots of different ones that have been commissioned around the country. The reason for not using your own camera is because you don't want patient clinical photos uploaded to the cloud um, because that has potential for hacking and you don't know where it's being stored. We're always going to take two macro shots, shots as well as any demoscopy photos that we take. We're going to take a localising photo and a close up photo. If we're taking photos for monitoring purposes, then it's really helpful sometimes to have a, a photo on the patient's phone 
And if you can, certainly in primary care, we would take a photo through the dermatoscope on the patient's phone so they have a picture as well. We can either take that photo on the patient's phone and then send them the Accurix text, which will send a copy straight into their notes if you're worried and you don't have an app, for example, like Pando and you're in primary care. Or we can take uh, send the picture that we've taken as an Accurix attachment to their phone. And that's something that I would occasionally do as well in primary care. Here's an example of a distant macro close up and the demoscopy. And you can see from this that if you just had the close up and the demoscopy photos of this lesion, you would miss the fact that there is another, perhaps more significant lesion over here. The other advantage of the localizing photos uh, other advantages of localizing photos are that you can see the background skin damage. You can see whether it's an ugly duckling lesion or whether there are several that look like it. And also for a lesion of a given size, it makes a big difference exactly where it's localized and what the rest of that the rest of that patient's skin looks like, because it may be that a lesion, for example, a one centimeter lesion on a lower leg, if the lower leg is a very large leg, it might be possible to excise that and get primary closure. Whereas if that lower leg is a very small leg, then it may be that it's going to need a graft to get closure. And that's very helpful to know about beforehand. So we always need that localizing shot as well as the close up and the demoscopy. Here I've got another example where we've got the distant macro, the localizing picture, I've got the demoscopy, and I've got the close-up clinical photo. And once again, the close-up clinical photo and demoscopy on their own are very nice to have and let you make the diagnosis, for example, for this BCC. But actually that localizing photo is the one that tells me that this one may be a little bit tricky to get primary closure. Again here, lovely photos of this melanoma. Beautiful photo there, no idea where on the body it is. Let's have a look. And there it is, and on this bit of the shin, it's going to be quite tricky to get primary closure. So practically, when we're taking photos of lesions, we want a localizing clinical photo, a close-up clinical photo, and the demoscopy photos, we want wet non-polarised and wet polarised. When we're taking photos for rashes, it's slightly different. We still want that localising clinical picture. And in fact, we may need several or many of those, particularly if there are lots of different parts of the body affected. Remember that we always need to see both sides. And we always need to, so for example, for a rash on a hand, we need to see both hands, front and back. And we need to make sure that we can see, at a minimum, the edges of the rash or where the rash goes to, and um, ideally to at least one joint on either side if it's on a limb. For rashes, we also want a close-up clinical photo. And if we're taking demoscopy photos of rashes, this is the one time when we would use dry polarised demoscopy, because for rashes, the pattern of scale can be helpful. So here's an example where I've got the localizing photo, which shows you quite nicely that this is an ugly duckling. Here is the clinical close-up photo, again, looking worrying. And here are the non-polarized and polarized demoscopy photos of this lesion, which help us to diagnose it as a separate keratosis. If you just had the wet polarized photo, it's harder to make the diagnosis. It's much easier if you've got the wet polarised and the wet non-polarised photo. Now for a very large lesion like this one on the lower leg, as you can see, when I've tried to take a picture of it through the scope, it's actually bigger than the scope. I haven't got all the edges here. So you may need to take multiple photos. And if taking multiple photos, I would always take one like this, where you've got as much of it in it as you can. And then I'd go close up for the centre and around the edges, taking multiple photos in polarised and non-polarised mode. Now, you may end up with a lot of photos, a lot of photos of a large lesion, particularly polarised and non-polarised photos of it. Um, and that's just one of those things with the big lesions. 
how to get good quality photos? Well, ideally focus the scope before attaching the camera, unless it's a fixed focus dermatoscope. You'll always get better quality photos of lesions if you use liquid interface, even in polarized mode, unless you are using a scope that doesn't have an end plate, in which case clearly you can't use a liquid interface. If you are using a polarized only scope that doesn't have an end plate, you will always get better pictures though by just wetting the surface of the skin. And that just removes some of the um, artifact that you get from the flaky dry skin surface. And you can do that just with an alcohol wipe. You do need dry dermoscopy though for rashes because the pattern of scale matters. So here's an example of a lesion where we've got a polarised picture with no liquid interface at the top. Now this is the same lesion still polarised with liquid interface and what's happened here is these short white lines at the top are actually artefact from the dry skin surface. Some contact fluid removes that surface artefact problem and then we can see that actually the white lines we are seeing are very different to these and these are not polarisation specific white lines. Now there are some pale lesions where there's not enough contrast on the lesion itself um, for the autofocus on a camera to work. It's great if you've got an SLR camera and you can focus it yourself, you can get around that. And for most mobile phones, you can tap the screen on your phone for the bit you want it to focus on. But if you're stuck, the other option that you can do is you can make a little dot next to the lesion with a pen and that will help you see it better. That will help the camera focus it better. Now bubbles can be a problem. And the reason that bubbles are a problem is because white circles like this are used to help us to diagnose some lesions. So it's these white circles that help us to work out that this is actually a squamous cell carcinoma. The trouble that we have is whilst that's a white circle, this down here is an air bubble. And it's quite clear when we're looking at it in real life because we see the air bubbles moving. We can tell which are air bubbles and which are white circles. But if we've got small air bubbles like this, overlying something that doesn't have white circles, then it may give an incorrect diagnosis. So how can we avoid getting bubbles? Well, one way to avoid bubbles or to reduce the amount of bubbles is to use a less viscous fluid. The other thing you can do is you can, if you, um, if you put the scope on and you're looking with some fluid, you take the scope off to get the camera, for example, and pop it back on again, if you wipe away all the fluid that's there, contact fluid on the skin and contact fluid on the scope and reapply it when you reapply the scope, then you will get fewer bubbles that way as well. Pressure can be another problem as well. So in this BCC, in the top picture, you can see there's a bit more pressure than in the bottom picture. And one of the things with BCCs in particular is that one of the features that helps us make the diagnosis is these well-focused, these sharply focused vessels right on the surface. So if we're compressing them, we can't see them. So how can we reduce the effect of pressure? Well, to reduce the effect of pressure, we're actually going to use a more viscous fluid and be careful not to press too hard. Or alternatively, we can take the end plate off the scope and use it in polarised mode without having it in contact with the skin. If the end plate doesn't come off, you can actually, if you've got an extendable and retractable one, you can just retract it and hold the scope at the correct distance to get a good focus if you've got a steady hand. Um, and if you've got one with a fixed focus end plate, then it's much more difficult and then you're going to have to use a more viscous fluid, making sure not to press too hard. There are a few other photo tips as well. So to reduce vignetting, which is where you lose some of the um, detail in the center, if you zoom in with the camera before you take the photo, you will get much better quality pictures that are easier to look at. And that's particularly true if you're using an optical rather than a digital zoom. If it's a digital zoom that you're using, for example, on your mobile phone, you can actually just take the picture like this and then crop it afterwards. It's always useful to get the graticule showing because then you've got the measurements there for the lesion. So on the left here, I've got the graticule showing. So I've got the measurements for the lesion. 
On the right, I haven't, so I haven't got the millimetre scale on there. For hard to reach places, you may need to use what we call the small contact end plate. This is a proboscis type adapter. There is another type that's more conical. They vary from scope to scope and many but not all scopes will have one. Um, have a look at the spreadsheet on the PCDS website for details of what scopes have what. If you're taking pictures and you're seeing this, this is shadows. And what's happening here is that you've got a dermatoscope which has an end plate that needs to be extended but hasn't been. And as you extend the end plate, the shadow will disappear very nicely and you'll be able to get a much better picture. So for more information on taking good dermoscopic photos, have a look at the PCDS website. That's the link for that one. And if you would like to watch a six and a half minute video on YouTube on taking demoscopy pictures just as a refresher, which doesn't have all the introductory bit, but just has the basics on the photos, then follow that link. It's important when we're using demoscopy and taking demoscopy photos to think about why we're doing it. And we are using this to make the diagnosis of lesions including, for example, the subtypes of BCC. That's important because a superficial BCC can be treated with topical or medical therapies, whereas a solid BCC or an infiltrative BCC can't. And we do see photos of BCCs that look like they're going to be superficial, but on demoscopy, you can see small blue areas within them Wherever you have blue areas within them, that suggests a deeper component. Or we can see BCCs with what we call May globules, multiple aggregated yellow-white globules. And that again suggests that it's a subtype which cannot be treated medically and needs to be treated surgically. We can also use dermoscopy for planning and defining the margins for surgery. And that again, BCC is a great example of that, where the May globules may be an indicator that the BCC is actually extending beyond the obvious boundaries that you've managed to recognize clinically. You can also see how well defined the boundaries are, and that helps you work out your margins. So, for example, if you have a very well defined edge to it, so you can see exactly where it is, you might be able to take a two millimeter margin. Whereas if there is a much less well defined boundary, you may need to take four millimeters or more in order to be certain that you've got right to the edges of the lesion. The other thing we commonly use demoscopy for is for monitoring change in flat lesions. And for that purpose, it's really important that we've got good quality photos that we can use for monitoring. And so we need to be able to see that pigment network, for example, in the melanocytic lesions. So in summary, demoscopy needs a combination of light and magnification and some magic. Without the magic, it's not demoscopy. The magic can be magic light, polarised light, or the magic of contact fluid, or both. But dry and no, uh, dry and no polarised light has no magic light, and no magic contact fluid. There's no magic to it. That's just light and magnification. Dry polarised demoscopy, we don't use so much for lesions, but it's really useful for rashes to see the pattern of scale. And it's also really useful on the scalp where you need to see the pattern of scale on the scalp. And so if you're photographing a lesion or a rash on the scalp, it's useful to have dry polarised as well as the wet polarised and non-polarised demoscopy. The best contact fluid to use, generally, if you're going to have one for everything, is going to be lubricating jelly. Um, alcohol hand gel is also quite handy. Do remember to clean the scope with an alcohol swab after each use. And some scopes will have disposable end plates and you can also use cling film if you're careful. This QR code in the top right corner will take you to the demoscopy web page of the PCDS website, which has got lots of information and resources about demoscopy, 
There are lots of short presentations on there. There's a link to the um, YouTube channel. There are video reviews of various different dermatoscopes and all the information I've given you today and more on there. Um, do have a look at the website. It's really worth having a look at. Hope you found that useful and I hope I will see you at one of our PCDS courses. We do demoscopy for absolute beginners, demoscopy for intermediates, advanced demoscopy and even an international virtual demoscopy session every year. So hopefully I'll get to see you in person sometime. Take care. Bye bye.